Around Halloween of this year, we got the latest update from Red Barrels for their multiplayer horror title, The Outlast Trials. If you haven't checked it out already, check out my video on Season 1 of The Outlast Trials, where I dissect the lore, the documents, explain the historical setting in which the trials take place, and how what is happening in Trials relates to the other Outlast games in the franchise. There was a brand new location added, which was the Courthouse, and if you want to watch me play through the Courthouse trial along with its MK challenges, then check out my Outlast Trials Let's Play over on my other channel. For this video though, we'll be looking at Program Geister and what it was intended for. We'll also look at new documents which were scattered around the trial environments that themselves give a great insight into the different enemies in the trials, and we'll look at a brand new ending involving one of the Murkoff reagents. Please note that there will be spoilers in this video for the Outlast Trials. And before we jump into the video though, a quick word from the sponsor of this video, Atlas VPN. Atlas VPN are back with another amazing offer. This time, as part of their Black Friday price cut, they are offering you a three-year VPN plan for just $1.70 per month plus six months extra. With over 750 servers around the world, connection to Atlas VPN servers is incredibly stable and lightning fast. Now, this means that if you're a gamer playing online competitively or just for fun and need a reliable connection, then this is ideal for you. As well as that benefit, you'll also be safe from being DDoSed and also from things such as avoiding a lobby full of bots. Of course, it's not just used for gaming. As a massive sports fan myself, living in the UK, I find it extremely difficult to watch any US sports, so I just hop on to Atlas VPN, fire up whatever US-based streaming service I use, and I can watch anything – basketball, baseball, and American football. This is also really good for using in conjunction with Netflix, where you can turn on your VPN and use it to access Netflix servers around the world. Different servers, of course, mean different options. You can use it on multiple devices and Atlas VPN can also block any malicious links, ads and trackers and it also notifies you if and when someone is trying to steal your data. So make sure you take up this amazing 3 year VPN plan for $1.70 per month. Remember you also get those 6 months extra too and that works out at 86% off. You also have a 30 day money back guarantee as well. Be quick and get your deal by clicking the link in the description box below or by looking for the pinned link in the comments section. Alright, so let's start looking at the spooky season event in Trials named Program Geister. For Geister itself, there were four particular documents that gave an insight into the tensions between Dr. Easterman, the man overseeing the Trials, and ex-Nazi scientist Dr. Rudolf Wernicke. As most of you will be aware, Wernicke would go on to develop something called the Morphogenic Engine. As explored in Outlast 1, this engine would only be compatible with subjects who had experienced enough horror. The subject needed to be a lucid dreamer, and the subject who was compatible with the engine would reach what was termed as lateral ascension. This lateral ascension would birth an entity made up of nanomachines that Wernicke and Murkoff called the Wall Rider. Those who would not be compatible with the engine would suffer grotesque disfigurement as a result. Anyway, in the trials, we see Dr. Wernicke there in the sleep room. The sleep room being the holding area for the test subjects, called reagents. Considering Wernicke was actually based in Los Alamos, conducting his research on dream therapy, it was strange to see him in Arizona at the Signala facility. In Easterman's journal, dated the 28th of August 1959, Easterman writes about Wernicke being there. He states that Wernicke seems to haunt the sleep room. He's completely disinterested in the Murkoff staff and what they are doing, but he's instead fixated on the reagents as they rest between trials. One of the nurses in the sleep room environment, Emily Barlow, has told Easterman that Wernicke appears to be watching the reagents sleep. Not only that, but Wernicke has been participating in some of the reagents' trauma therapy. Essentially, some reagents were paralysed from their trauma from the trials, so Wernicke, with his work on dreams and superstition, would attempt his own form of invasive therapy. Easterman's project was named Project Lathe, which was using limbic aggression therapy. Limbic aggression therapy, as explained in my other video, is a form of therapy which targets the part of the brain called the amygdala, the part of the brain which triggers the fight or flight response, and the trials would act as a sort of horror-themed Disneyland, which, through the trauma inflicted, would forcefully coerce reagents to form new sets of morals, behaviours and beliefs. Anyway, Lathe was canned because too many subjects were dying, along with staff, and Project Lathe 2 was birthed, and Lathe 2 are the trials we see active in the game. Easterman considered Wernicke's work to be too invasive. He was worried that Wernicke's work would infect his work on Project Lathe. 
A few weeks after Easterman wrote that journal entry, a telephone conversation took place between CIA agent Jameson Lawler, who was the agency's representative for the experiments, and Murkoff employee A. Bradley Avianos, who effectively pitched the whole idea of chemical refinement to the Murkoff board. They talk about Los Alamos and program Geister, that Geister is in partnership with Wernicke's lab in Los Alamos. They discuss Fidel Castro and what happened in Cuba, that towards the end of the Cuban revolution in January 1959, they saw Fidel Castro on the Ed Sullivan show and seemed to be worried about public perception seeing him as a, a good person. They mention something called United Fruit. Lawler is referring to the United Fruit Company, a company that would later become Chiquita. The United Fruit Company would come to own 3.5 million acres of land in Central America, with the majority of that land being held in Guatemala. This led to the term Banana Republics, a poor country which is dependent on a specific fruit export. So United Fruit had the monopoly in these so-called banana republics. In 1952, the United Fruit Company essentially tried to buy Guatemala. And what I mean by that is that Guatemala had had enough of corporate ownership in their country and started to fight back. The Guatemalan government started to give away land to Guatemalan families, and this was what was known as land reform. So United Fruit, in response, offered the democracy that the Guatemalan people yearned for and offered them their land back in exchange for just under $20 million, when in reality the land was only worth just over $1 million. The political stakes had driven up the price. The Guatemalan government naturally refused to pay the inflated cost for their own land, so United Fruit contacted the US government, namely President Eisenhower, and Guatemala's elected president Jacobo Arbenz was overthrown by the US in a coup d'etat. Now, due to the anti-US feeling in Latin America at the time, revolutionaries such as Che Guevara and, in this case, Fidel Castro, started to gain a foothold. Then, both Castro and Guevara seized power in Cuba by removing the US-backed Fulgencio Batista. This would eventually lead to the failed Bay of Pigs invasion and the resulting Cuban Missile Crisis, but that's not for this video, back to Program Geister again. It's obvious to deduce that the reagent that was sent to Cuba to assassinate Fidel Castro failed in their task. As we saw previously, the reagent woke up in their hotel room, covered in blood, with no memory of what they had done. They then received a call from someone with the trigger words, Spider, Eye and Lamb. The CIA and the US government were starting to get a little bit antsy and they wanted results, and they wanted them faster. The money was there, the CIA were willing to spend it. But this conversation between Lawler and Avianos details that Easterman's project is taking too long and that they need to try something different, something more drastic. Easterman's work, merged with Wernicke's dream therapy, would be a more aggressive program. Lawler agrees with the program, stating that they need actionable weapons and not eventual disruption that Wernicke is promising nightmare material. So, Program Geister is a go. Another couple of weeks later, Avianos writes to the Murkoff board. He reports certain side effects resulting from Project Lathe 2, notably in Reagent 0877, who I believe to be Simon Peacock. 0877 was shipped off to Los Alamos as they were described as being special. The letter mentions that subjects are showing extrasensory activity, which relates to the Skinner Man the entity which appears to be a representation of Dr. Easterman. Wernicke was attempting to trace the increase in these hallucinations through program Geister. Side note, the German noun for ghost is Geister, hence the name. Wernicke had proposed the idea of trials in program Geister, and the results would be shared with the team at Los Alamos and the staff at Mount Massive Hospital. Program Geister is then approved by the Murkoff board. The Geister trials will be under the authority of the staff at Los Alamos and not Eastman and the staff at Signala. A handwritten note at the bottom states that the Murkoff board have dangerous expectations. And this handwritten note leads us on to the next point. The reagent we control in the game, essentially the protagonist, finds the documents in the trial environments. But how are these documents getting into these trial environments? Who is leaking them? So this next storyline involves Clyde Perry. You remember Clyde. Clyde's photograph was hanging up in Mount Massive. He was listed as the Director of Historical Refinement from 1959, where this storyline takes place. We previously saw Clyde Perry in his role in the Murkoff Collections Department. His role was to observe different reagents after their release, as well as to scout and recruit potential prime assets such as Mother Gooseberry, Phyllis Futterman, and Sergeant Leland Coyle. One or two of these meetings turned violent, and Perry was forced to kill some reagents. 
One particular meeting with Coyle resulted in Perry suffering horrible injuries after Coyle realized that Perry was there to bribe him. This continued up until 1959 when Perry was attacked yet again, but this time more severely. Murkoff doctors worked on him and had to reconstruct his leg and his skull, such was the severity of the attack. This is the likely reason why Perry is blind in one eye and shows slight disfigurement in his picture. Perry was then forced to resign from the collections department given his now limited mobility. He wrote to the board requesting reassignment on the 7th of November 1959. A conversation then took place between Perry and Avianos. They were discussing a leak. Potentially hundreds of sensitive internal documents, memos, letters, transcriptions and photographs had found their way into the trial environments and were found by reagents. Perry panicked, but Avianos was calm. He mentions a rat, or more likely a member of staff succumbing to the pressure, is responsible. They suspect that it is the pushers who are leaving the documents in the trials. We will be discussing different enemies in this next section of the video, but in terms of the pushers, internal documents describe the pushers. They are members of the Sinyala research staff who are affected by the chemicals. More on them later in the video. Anyway, the reason for Avianos not being worried about these leaks was that he knew the trials were sealed environments. Any memories of the trials and reagents are deeply subconscious. Still, Perry was very worried, especially since he was mentioned in those documents through his work as a field agent. This is where Clyde Perry's new job role comes into being. It was at this point that he would become the director of historical refinement in line with his picture in Mount Massive. Clyde Perry's job was to discover the source of the leak and how the documents are finding their way into the trial environments, removing them from the trial environments, and the suppression of any leaked information, and to corrupt and confuse any anti murkoff narratives. On the 21st of November 1959, Perry, having already obtained some of these documents, wrote to Dr. Easterman detailing these leaked Murkoff documents. Perry mentions errors and suggests that Easterman's staff take better care in the way these documents are transcribed, with the correct dates recorded, along with the eradication of spelling errors. Well, it's safe to say that Easterman didn't take kindly to Perry's request. He wrote back to Perry, basically said, stop bothering him, as it's irrelevant to the work he's doing at Sinyala. That's all we get on this particular story thread, but it's intriguing nonetheless. The previous year, in September 1958, a memorandum was sent out to all Sinyala staff. In line with the new Project Lathe, Project Lathe 2, Experimental Population Volunteers, XPOP for short, underwent an assignation, or the allocation, for their use in the trials. They were put into groups in order to identify them as archetypes, and how they had been created, or augmented. Now, General XPOP, which used to be referred to as grunts, are considered to be lost men, vanishable, worthless people that society would not miss, addicts and felons, etc. They are described as easy to recruit due to the alluring nature of charity outreach to this type of person. Lathe One's experiments uncovered that General XPOP were very susceptible to guidance from prime assets. The charisma of the prime assets was a crucial factor in these behaviours. The General XPOP were considered to be the most expendable form of XPOP. The next one's pretty self-explanatory. Heavy XPOP used to be referred to in the first phase of Project Lathe as Big Grunts. They were thought to have been violent children. They were reported to have been remnants of external experiments involving hormone therapy and limb extension surgery to be used in military applications. They are very strong, almost impossible to restrain physically, but conditioned for total obedience. They are mentally like children. Lathe would exploit this, as heavy X-Pop would believe pretty much anything. On to Pouncers. Pouncers originate from Mount Massive Hospital. They are patients with paranoid tendencies. They are described as having a high resting amygdala activity. This suggests that they experience a high amount of anxiety and depression. Such as their paranoia, Pouncers create their own personal Faraday cages. These cages are normally used to block out electromagnetic fields, preventing those electromagnetic fields from entering whatever's inside. They achieved this by pushing nails and other metal objects into their own skin. They sometimes seek out metal boxes to hide inside, which itself would act as a Faraday cage. These little turds lay in wait for someone to pass by, and they pounce out of wherever they are hiding and attack. As detailed in the memorandum though, a simple wrap to the nose or a brick or bottle to the face will temporarily discourage them. Screamers next. 
These are described as a sleep deprivation banshee. They are a gift from Wernicke and his mates in Los Alamos. They were developed based on random experimentation in German concentration camps during World War II. They underwent treatment, which altered their vocal cords and their diaphragm, resulting in a deafening level of volume when screaming, enough to temporarily stun anyone in proximity. Attempting to recreate the state in Los Alamos, researchers used amphetamines which caused a waking nightmare state to put the subject in permanent twilight, a state of near sleep. They would always sleep and if disturbed from their slumber and their psychosis, they would unleash their scream and escape to another area free from disturbance. Their sleep deprivation has resulted in great suffering, but they apparently find temporary relief through the act of screaming. Due to the nature of these ex-pops, Signala staff are required to wear ear protection. Now on to imposters. These ex-pops are classed as tricksters. They have been given latex masks in order to imitate reagents as a way to teach the trial subjects that nothing and no one is to be trusted. These imposters are actually placed into the trial environment nude and are left to equip and outfit themselves with whatever they can find. These imposters have on occasion managed to steal clothing from Signala staff and impersonated scientists. As a way to find out whether someone had encountered an imposter, a staff member was instructed to say hello, and if the other person's lips didn't move when saying it back, then they are clearly an imposter. These massive great big lumps of rage are known as berserkers. They are the previous results of prison experiments regarding weaponized syphilis. As a result, they are blind and get disoriented. However, they are incredibly strong and aggressive. They were experimented on further at Los Alamos, and the team there inserted steel pins into sensitive areas, made them bigger through the use of hormones, and lengthened their limbs. They were thought to have been useful for urban and jungle warfare in communist countries. They have the propensity to self-mutilate, so metal plates were placed over their faces. This was due to the fact that they seemed to hate their own eyes and basically got rid of them, and picked at their own brains, essentially self-lobotomizing. Berserkers were actually one of the closest ex-pops to Wernicke's theories of lateral ascension. They seemed to take delight in violence against others. They even seemed to worship it. One interesting note is that Signala staff are strongly advised not to engage berserkers in conversation or even to listen to them. Staff members have been known to harm themselves following exposure to this type of ex-pop. And finally, pushers. We mentioned earlier that pushers are essentially Signala staff that had lost it through chemical exposure. This may have been a result of their close proximity to the trial environments. Pushers are equipped with aerosolized medicating equipment but make their own psychoactive chemicals. Reagents were reported to be developing a tolerance to these chemicals, but the pushers preempted this and made more volatile compounds which allowed for an even deeper level of drug-induced psychosis. It was thought that their delusional state was the result of a perceived relationship with the Skinner Man and by extension Dr. Easterman. They appear to suffer from the pseudo bulbar effect, where the sufferer has uncontrolled fits of laughter which don't match their internal feelings. The pusher is a stark reminder to Signala staff to prioritise their own hygiene and safety standards and to observe protocols. By the same token though, the pusher is a reminder to staff that every accident is an opportunity for innovation. Finally, let's discuss this new ending. Previously, and as already discussed, the previous ending showed a reagent going through the farewell trial. They've gone through every trial, the conditioning has taken place, and the trigger word is there in the subconscious, lying dormant, ready to be awoken. The reagent then woke up some time later in a hotel room in Havana, Cuba, presumably having attempted to assassinate Fidel Castro. Obviously they failed. The phone rang and the words were repeated once more. Spider, I, and Lamb. This time we get a glimpse into another reagent's awakening, if you like. Rewinding to the beginning of the cutscene, we can immediately see the South Vietnamese flag. Now we know from history that the US, word that communism would spread to South Vietnam and to the rest of Asia, sent money, supplies and military advisors to help the South Vietnamese government fight off the communist north. The reagent at one point hears the words, only I love you, and this is very likely the echoing words of Dr. Easterman, who would frequently see himself as a father figure to his subjects. You're special. Nobody else is operating on your level, and I have special things planned for you. Keep going. 
The building the reagent arrives at is a hotel called Hotel Saigon, which appeared to be hosting a friendship conference between the US and South Vietnam. It's very clear that Murkoff's partnership with the CIA and US government is to create sleeper agents and actionable weapons of destruction, which would essentially give the US plausible deniability. Now, the first rebirth ending makes sense, since the US government were hell-bent on taking out Castro, but the second one does not. The US were allied with South Vietnam. The hotel was hosting a conference to celebrate the relationship between the US and South Vietnam. Their goal was to stop the communist machine from spreading to the north. This bombing seems counterproductive. Why bomb a hotel full of allies? Has something gone wrong? Is Easterman plotting something? Or is this just part of a bigger scheme within the US government? Given that the new and updated documents mentioned and referred to Castro, Maybe the next Trials update would allow us to find out why this happened and the bigger picture behind it. It may be that Murkoff are just doing Murkoff things, tinkering behind the scenes, orchestrating, plotting, planning, something which they will benefit from. Now this could just be a reference to something else. For example, there were two real-life car bombings that took place in South Vietnam around this time. The first was on March 30th, 1965, when what was considered to be a Viet Cong car bomb exploded outside the US Embassy in Saigon, killing a female CIA officer named Barbara A. Robbins. She was the first CIA officer to die in the line of duty. This was a different location, sure, but it's something to bear in mind. The second was a bombing that took place underneath a hotel in Saigon called the Brinks Hotel on Christmas Eve in 1964. The Brinks Hotel was being used to house US Army officers and the Viet Cong detonated the car bomb underneath the hotel. This could be another reference, but at this point, who knows? We'll have to wait to find out in the next update. But that pretty much covers everything in the latest update for the Outlast Trials. I can't wait to see what Red Barrels has in store for us with the next update. I'm very eager to find out more. If you enjoyed this video then please leave a like and subscribe to the channel to show your support and leave a comment down below sharing your theories on that new ending. But for now take care and I'll see you in the next one.